Thanks. I'm going to skip the first, you know, 20% just to be at the safe side. Um, that was a joke. Um, uh, this is going to be a little bit of an oddball talk. Uh, unlike previous times I've spoken in Guadalajara, this is not really about a project. This is more me reporting on what my experience was and when I tried something and what I, I think I learned from it and maybe what could be useful to everyone else. So I hope it's useful to you. Maybe if you've done any home automation stuff in the past, would you mind raising your hand or indicating? So a few people have. Uh, not a ton. That's that's probably pretty typical. It's a, like a growing area of interest, but it's not like uh, taking over the world. Um, I need to figure out how to advance my slides, though. There we go. Um, so really what, what I'm asking here is uh, when we talk about uh, home automation, is there a role for a desktop system like GNOME to play there? And this, uh, what I'm going to say is based on little experimental stuff that I've been doing. I've actually been doing home, home automation things for a really long time, like decade and a half almost. And it took a few swings across the years at figuring out how to integrate the desktop computer to it. But I'm going to try to not really get into the, the technical side because my playground is really hacky and it's not something I want to say you should emulate. Uh, but also because I, I think that the real important questions here are conceptual and those are the harder harder things to decide and that's what we need to work through first. I'll give some examples of what that means, um, but you'll see. Um, so question zero, before we even get started there, is you've got to determine what do we mean when we say home automation and GNOME fitting together. If you were at Guadec last year, um, this is sort of semi-background, but there was a there's a talk, one of the one of the short talks, uh, which the title of which mentioned IoT things in GNOME, and I, I went to that sort of expecting it would be about, I don't know, using IoT devices through the GNOME environment and um, sort of practical, and it wasn't like that. And so at the time, I was kind of bummed out that it wasn't what I thought it was going to be about. On the other hand, that ended up being like the most uh, effective Guadalajara talk ever because it, after that I started thinking about this a lot more seriously and um, there's not an obvious answer um, like because GNOME desktops are so much more interactive than the things we typically think of as home automation. So just to give you a brief background, uh, especially if you haven't messed with it before, I need to tell you a few things about the what's really happening when we do home automation. Um, first thing to realize is there's only a handful of, of platforms for, for doing this. If you're a do-it-yourself or in a free software person, there's Home Assistant, there's Open Hab. Uh, there's a couple others. There's a Perl one. Um, but when you choose your platform, you're stuck there for a really long time. Um, and that's important to realize uh, moving forward. Um, also, the bulk of the code in any of these home automation platforms is devoted to maintaining the set of small components, each of which connects to a real specific product line, the light bulbs from company X, maybe light bulb two from company X, switches from another company, an API from some third company. Uh, there's a little little icing on there, but it's a lot of maintenance work um, in terms of lines of code to keep those components tracking the changes that come from the vendors. On the other hand, the actual important part of each of these platforms is really just that they have a state engine and they have something that processes events. So all of that, that bulky code that's there to support specific devices doesn't really do home automation. The home automation is the thing that maintains which lights are on and which lights are off and triggers something when someone walks by a proximity sensor. And what makes a home automation platform good or bad is whether that's easy to use, whether it's too slow, whether it has the right services and um, in terms of how you define things. Um, and that leads into what the real work is. When you're doing home automation, the real work is done by you making these decisions about how you define what's a meaningful thing to automate in your house. And what distinguishes one platform from another, practically speaking, is whether or not that's easy for you. So the formats you have to use to write up your descriptions of which, which lights work together, which don't, is that easy to do? Are there primitives for selecting things? Uh, I didn't understand that at first when I first got into it, but you add a bunch of smart light bulbs and you start to figure it out. 
And the fact that you defining these combinations of states and these sequences is the real work, that's why you're stuck on your platform for a long time after you choose it. So you can't take all that stuff and just reinstall it from Home Assistant into OpenHab because it's a completely different way to define all those things. It's also important to realize that home automation instances are all different. So there's not a lot of places to generalize stuff really well. Um, you can go and look at other people's configurations on, on GitHub and on Home Assistant, the site, and so on. Uh, the people who publish theirs and, and broadcast them tend to be the heavier weight users, but um, the average one, I would say, has a few lights in key places, not every light in the house. Usually there's some kind of utility monitoring, and usually there's a media box of some kind, um, which gives sort of a tangent that uh, Kodi is really, really nice for doing home automation things and, and for writing extensions. And it, it reminds me that it's a platform we don't talk about inside the, the FOSS world too much, but like Kodi and OpenWRT are more widely used than Desktop Linux. And we, we got to accept that and maybe start to take them more seriously in terms of how we interact. Uh, okay, so just briefly, because everyone will ask this, um, I moved in January to, to another country, and so my automation setup has changed. Uh, I have Home Assistant running. It's on a single core NUC machine, which is a little fanless Intel thing. Um, at the moment, I have some Zigbee bulbs and an environmental sensor that's Z-Wave, and I've got some Bluetooth LE stuff. Um, in my previous place, which was a house in another country, I also had Wi-Fi thermostat and some networked media player things that just came that way out of the box and a sprinkler controller that I had to like build. Uh, and then a lot of like legacy things like X10 and Insteon, which are not technologies you want to start using now. Um, notably though, I would say, note that this doesn't include all the generic computing devices around the house. Like we don't typically consider those part of home automation. And that's interesting because that's sort of what I'm talking about with GNOME. Like I had a Myth TV server and front end, and I had laptops and things. Uh, and ultimately, like, that, that NUC that's running Home Assistant is just another server. Uh, it can run other things, and, and it does. Um, as far as what I used it for, most of my automations were time-driven, which includes things that are based on the, the sunrise and so on. And I did a few, a few things for uh, monitoring device states, and I, I grouped a few things into rooms. Uh, based on like proximity, stuff in the backyard, stuff in the living area. Uh, and I would, I would say that's pretty typical. Like the, the people who, like I said, the people who advertise, look at my configuration on GitHub, it's going to be large. But if you go to like the forums where people are asking for help, you'll see that most users have a rather modest sub. Anyway, that's all the background. Uh, question one, when we're saying if we want a, a desktop Linux system to be part of our home, home automation, um, the question is, what does it contribute to that home that we just saw that, that that's automated somehow? Like, what states of the machine are important? What actions? What triggers? Uh, and not everything that's possible in Home Assistant makes sense. Like, just because there's a screen on your laptop does not mean you should treat it like a media player. And just because it's, it uses electricity doesn't mean you should have a wall switch that turns it on and off. I think it's clear that, that that's not particularly useful. Uh, so when I thought about this, I ended up with three things that I think are relevant to a, about a GNOME desktop when we're integrating it into home automation. And the first thing is that it's an interactive device. If it's a desktop system, there's a person there. That's not necessarily true of an embedded system and a server that can be headless, but there's somebody there. And that tells us that the first thing that's important is that the state of the GNOME session is important. We're really talking about the person being there being, being the session state. Um, it also, though, means we probably don't expect a, a GNOME system to accept commands. Like, you don't want to push a button and have it log you out. Um, it's more likely that we, we want things that we choose to do at the desktop to affect the rest of the house um, or affect other objects in the house. Um, and there are things, I think, that you do in a desktop system that are like that, and it's important to enumerate those. Um, for example, just think about multimedia playback. A lot of people, like I said, have a media player and they'll play ambient music through, you know, the Kodi box or their Alexa device or whatever. And it seems like if that's happening and you start 
to watch a video on your computer, it would be nice if the other music could pause. Um, that's the sort of thing I mean. Um, the third facet is uh, the reality is that users have different categories of tasks that they be, might be doing at their at their desktop system, and that can which sort of task they're working on can be important for how the house responds. Uh, just think of like you're you're in your work or you're you're playing, and you might expect other things to happen around the house depending on that. Um, it's not necessarily easy to define those, but I tried to enumerate what I thought. GNOME sessions and GNOME desktops could do there. So um, my little taxonomy uh, on the interactivity facet, the first one, um, it'd be good to know whether someone is logged in or not and not just in a binary state. It's working here. All right. I'll just tell you. So there's an interactivity um, uh, are you logged in? Are you logged out? Does the machine go to sleep, wake up? Uh, maybe also things like failed login attempts. Um, if the system freezes, it would be nice to know. There's a long running process that finishes. Um, sometimes you might say messaging applications are useful, like the away from keyboard notification. Um, I'm moving on in the slides to the, the surrounding the environment thing. Like I mentioned, media playback is, is pretty obvious. If there's audio playing or video playback, maybe even a game going on, that would be useful to be able to communicate to other devices around the house. I would say also uh, the microphone state and the webcam state. Do we need to do something? And whether or not someone is being recorded, that has like privacy implications, uh, but it all also could be a practical thing where if you can see in your home automation dashboard that whoever's in the office computer is recording something, you might be, okay, I, I don't want to go interrupt them there. Uh, power consumption would be the same way. Is the, is the laptop charging right now or not? You might, if you're paying for your electricity or it's coming from battery or solar power, that can be important to note for home automation purposes. And then there's some generic things that are just sort of computer based and, and like printing and uh, running a network backup, that sort of thing. Um, on that third facet, the work versus play question, um, it's hard to, it's a little harder to figure out how we would implement that in GNOME. You could define these are work apps and these are play apps, but that's super variable from one person to another. Like, if your job is developing a game, then firing up a game is, should not switch you into play mode. Uh, conversely, if you code for fun, firing up an ID does not mean that you should be sending the signal that you're, you're in work mode. Uh, there are some other things that we could do, like maybe track what window has focus, and you don't necessarily have, a, have an all or nothing um, work versus play here, but this is a signal that you send that you make a decision based on, on later. And then there's things like, like time trackers. Uh, so getting into what I actually did, there's a system called MQTT, which is basically text-based messages, um, which you can publish to a topic of your choosing and you can subscribe to. Uh, and so I essentially hacked in MQTT messages, oops, sorry, um, to a bunch of different places. Um, that second line, the first bullet point there is an example, MQTT has a lot of clients. The simplest one with command line is called Mosquito. And so the Mosquito pub there sends a message to the MQTT broker and you give a topic which is divided by, uh, by slashes and then you give it a message. And then anyone who wants to subscribe to that can do it. There are some um, ways to integrate this into Home Assistant like having it be a sensor or a switch. Uh, Generally, that's used to trigger something else happening. Um, what I did, um, sent MQTT messages when I logged in with Bash and when I logged out with Bash. That's pretty easy to do. Um, for launching applications, you can just write a wrapper script and it's probably more applicable to do that in a .desktop launcher. You can also listen for specific dbus signals with one of the dbus monitoring tools. Uh, the trick there is that you need to know the exact signal you're watching for, and that's not always easy. 
And then you can also just sort of add an MQTT layer on top of Home Assistant. Uh, I found the, the login stuff to be helpful for presence detection in Home Assistant. Presence is sort of a hierarchical where you, you want, you can maybe you lose a signal from a phone, so you don't just say someone's away when their phone disappears. You have multiple things you have to be aware of. But if someone is logged in and you're trying to leave the house, you, you want to know that. Um, like I said, some of the, the D-Bus cases are, are tricky to work with. Uh, I also tried to get uh, media playback working, and I found that less than 100% successful. Like, uh, it depends on the player you use. I know there's been some changes to the Empress format. Um, it's also, I wasn't able to get microphone and webcam signals working directly, but you can certainly fake your way through that by triggering when the application you're interested in launches. And then there are some applications like, like IRC that um, you can add your own scripts to at different points. Great. Um, we're out of time. I can show you the takeaways. Come talk to me if you want to know more about this. Um, but the the final uh, thing I want to say is that um, it's not trivial to figure out how to send messages that are meaningful for home automation. I think that GNOME as a project should think about the way application APIs make this simple or confusing. And I think that people are going to be doing DIY versions of this, so it would be good for us as a project to talk to them and help define meaningful messages and, and standards and hierarchies of things. So um, contact me or come see me if you want to know more. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan. And apologies for uh, for having to shrink your your talk we'll start with it we'll continue with the next talk as soon as possible